everybody. What is up? Welcome to episode, I don't know, 13, 14. I told you a long time ago I was going to stop counting and then I started counting again. Pretty sure this is going to be episode 13. Um, Either way, welcome. So happy to have you guys listening. I have one of my favorite people on the planet with me today. (laughs) I don't even think she... (laughs) I don't even think she knows she's one of my favorite people on the planet, but I, uh, I rave about her. Um, So pretty much everybody, (laughs) what'd you say? So that's nice to know. (laughs) I do. I do. I rave. So I have with me today, Rebecca Christensen, who I know personally, she is my clinical supervisor, Mm -hmm. right? Well, I guess I have my license. So technically... You could still be clinically supervised though when you have a license. So yeah. So basically what that means is like, Rebecca's my go-to woman. So (laughs) when I need help managing a client or honestly, these days, life has been such a shit show that Rebecca has been helping me navigate the the personal waters of my life. So she's my go-to woman when it comes to needing support because you know, one of the things that she said to me is every therapist has a good therapist, right? And Rebecca is, I kind of translate that to every part of my life, right? Every therapist also has a good mentor, a good role model. And Rebecca, I've known for not too long, it's only been about a year and a half. But she is somebody who has quickly turned into a mentor and role model for me in the field. She's an LCSW, so a licensed clinical social worker. And I am happy to have her on today. I'm so excited that she said yes. She's a very busy woman doing lots of things, taking the world by storm. So I'm (laughs) going to turn it over. Can you just like tell the world who you are, what you're doing? Well, that's um, quite an introduction. So um, I don't even know where to start with that. But thank you. Thank you for all of the I've overwhelmed I feel, you already. I feel a little <laughs> overwhelmed. I feel like, I don't know, like I need to straighten my terror or something. Um, so, um, I, um, I am a licensed clinical social worker. I went to school in Texas for undergrad, Louisiana for grad school. And the military moved us up to New Jersey. I love New Jersey. I think it gets a bad rap. Um, And we've been here since 1994. And I got licensed in 1996. And I do say that every good therapist has a good therapist and every good therapist has a good mentor. You're exactly right. I say that all the time because I believe that in my like heart of hearts. It's not an easy job. So I think support is what makes it all possible. Yeah, it's what makes you good at what you do is being able to reach out for support and knowing when you need support. That's all part of the job. I have a, um, I've been in private practice since um, 97. I started a really small private practice, but I worked primarily at um, different, a couple of different inpatient hospitals in the area. So that was my primary job. I started a small private practice. And then after I had kids, grew my private practice and left the hospital world. I have been lucky enough to work with some amazing people. I was in a group uh, practice for a while and then out on my own for many, many years and am recently starting a group practice like grassroots kind of a thing built sort of on my philosophy of, I think, in this world. That profits on our self-doubt, taking care of yourself is a rebellious act. That's my belief. I believe that it's important to rebel against what society thinks you should be. It's important to be who you are and be authentic. And sometimes that's a rebellious act. So kind of started to build a grassroots group practice based on that kind of philosophy, like be authentic, be who you are, learn who that is, make decisions. And that's what led you, that's what inspired the name of your group practice, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Which is? It's Rebellious Wellness Counseling. Rebellious Wellness Counseling. I love it. 
<laughs> it's the best <laughs> name. And I love that philosophy. And I think one of the things that comes to mind, and this is a little off topic, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So were you born in Texas? I was born and raised in Texas. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ah, it finally. Mm -hmm. Okay. So your accent finally makes so much sense to me. It's looking <laughs> so right now, say you everybody. Don't have an accent. <laughs> That's great. So many people say, you don't have an accent. And I think, <gasps> I say, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I do have an accent. If I talk to my family. I, I, right after I get off the phone, I have an accent, but that's funny. So you think I, some people do detect it, but yes. It is so funny. It has taken me until right now on this podcast to be able to ask you, it's always been in the back of my mind, like that she is from the South. And, you know, for those of you listening, like just one of the things that you will pick up from Rebecca right off the bat when you meet her is just this very like Southern hospitality feel um Aww. so I'm like she's gotta be from the south so you were born in Texas yep mm -hmm. okay and you still have family down there yeah my all of my family is there mm -hmm. and what brought you so then you said that you came to New Jersey which <laughs> you said you love New Jersey <laughs> I do. I do. So I got married uh, before, right out of college, actually, and went to grad school in Louisiana. Uh, my husband was military and we got transferred to New Jersey. When we got transferred, the whole squadron was like, where? I'm sorry, <laughs> where? Um, and we moved to New Jersey and I thought, I love New Jersey. This gets a bad rap. Like everybody thinks of ever, not everyone, but people from the South think of New Jersey as like the Newark airport, but that's a beautiful, yeah. I love South Jersey. I, I grew up like near Galveston. So that was my impression of the beach. And I don't know if you know anything about the Gulf, but the water's really dark. And so people here would go to the shore and I always thought, ew, and then one day I went to the Jersey Shore and I thought it was like the Bahamas. I was like, this is fabulous. So I'm like, I Jersey didn't know gets that bad. the Gulf was really dark. I always pictured the water being like crystal clear and beautiful. And so on what side of the Gulf? The Galveston side of the Gulf has really like really dark water. It's the sand is really, really dark. It's from the sand. The sand's really dark. So you know, I was like, so I think Jersey gets a bad rap and I love New Jersey. So I think as, as you know, um, I also have a Down syndrome daughter, so I did a lot of research, uh, and New Jersey ha is one of the very best states, one of the two best states in the United States to live in for special needs kids. They have yes. the most to offer, so that definitely made us stay right here. I could not be happier. So your roots are in Texas, but yeah. your, your heart is in Jersey. Yeah, we actually have a lot of listeners from Texas. A lot of people oh, from really? Texas that listen to the podcast. Yep. So oh, shout so out no. to everybody from yeah, Texas. Shout out to everybody from Texas. I love Texas. So just don't get I love, still love <laughs> Texas. Like I don't want anybody to get, you know, offended that I but I still love Texas. But yes, New Jersey is I think it gets a bad rap. I think it's a great place to live, actually. So oh, God bless you. You are one of the few. I know. I know. <laughs> One of the like, really, I'm like, yeah. So, but you know what? You are right. New Jersey really does a phenomenal job at providing services for those with special needs. Yeah, it really does. It's so unbelievable. And if you, if, if anybody out there is a listener who has a special needs child, they can feel free to call me because I'm well versed. My child's 22, so I've been through the process, and I can't even tell you from birth to through adulthood, it is an amazing state with very progressive thinking and um that alone makes me love new jersey yeah you know. jersey but, does it um, well they do it well when do. it comes to education for sure yep mm -hmm. so within your practice and within the, the patients that you see what areas do you specialize in i know but if you want to tell everybody um, my first specialty was bereavement i um 
was lucky enough as an intern way back, you know, way, way back there um, <laughs> to um, work under a phenomenal pioneer in grief and loss, in, especially in losing a child at Texas Children's Hospital. And I did an internship there that's actually set me back an entire semester from graduating. So I I had already planned my wedding. So I got married and then I moved back. I went back to school to finish my undergraduate because that's how important this internship was for me. So um, I had a significant loss in my own family of origin when I was in grad school. And I really do believe that the internship was the introduction to grief and loss for me. But I, through that internship, was able to start some sibling support groups which was an amazing opportunity. Um, So I also did that in Louisiana. And were they sibling support groups for like siblings who have lost? lost? Yeah. Who have lost a sibling. Yeah. Sibling support groups who had lost a sibling and how that changes the dynamic in your family. And so I did bereavement almost solely for grief and loss for, For a number of years. And when I moved to New Jersey, as I said, I worked inpatient and then was trained in um, CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy for um, depression and um, solution focused therapy and rational emotive, some other modalities that work better sort of inpatient when you're treating depression, anxiety, bipolar. But primarily my specialties lied in depression and anxiety with CBT and solution focused, rational motive, those kinds of therapies. And I, in 1998, decided that DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, became like sort of made its debut with Marsha Linehan and a, a friend of mine. Uh, and I were lucky enough to be trained by her in DBT, which was you an were amazing. You were trained by the Marsha Linehan? I was. You're basically famous. She's famous. Let's be. I mean, she's super famous, but. (sighs) Yeah, it was. I was actually starstruck. Uh, Yeah, Yeah. it was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. I went to the Cape Cod Symposium and was and she actually did the training and then flew out to Seattle to see her clinic. Was I was trained by the Marsh Linehan. Mm -hmm. It was pretty amazing. I started a DBT part of one of the hospitals that I worked in. That model didn't really, it was very hard under managed care to be able to do a DBT model, but I practiced DBT, still practice DBT. I don't currently do groups. Somebody that works for me does groups, but I still use a lot of DBT in my everyday work. I think that those are skill sets that everybody can use, learn, be reminded of. And then about six years, seven years ago, I, a friend of mine, a psychologist in Cherry Hill said, Hey, come to this training. Let's do this EFT for couples. So for anybody who knows that, you know, is cognitively trained, DBT is very cognitive behavioral as well. EFT is emotionally focused therapy for couples. It's like the other side of the spectrum. Right. And, um, I'm like, I don't do emotions. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yep. And she said, it's $800 and it's four days. And I said, girl, we could be in the Bahamas for, for $800 for four days. Like what? <laughs> yep. But I went and it's amazing. So I am in the certification process with, um, with that, with EFT for couples as well. It's an, I actually do think it's probably the, only couples therapy that truly works. So um, I I was previously trained in Imago couples therapy. So I did do a couples therapy, but I have to be honest before EFT for couples, I wasn't that successful, but that's, that was my last training. So DBT, you know, lots of different kind of you know, I'm really old. So lots of different kinds of therapies. Along the way. I am like, it sounds not. like I'm ancient, right? I was like trained by Marsha Linehan. Like I feel like a dinosaur, but it's <laughs> it was interesting in my career. It was interesting to go from this cognitive behavioral, this, you know, like mindset and skill set 
that really is so effective with anxiety and depression. Like to be able to treat, teach people skills and tools to manage their anxiety is so impactful. And then DBT to teach people interpersonal effectiveness and emotion regulation and so effective. These are skills that some people didn't grow up with. I think I think it should be taught in schools. That's one of what was one of my like I have too many passions, but one of my passions that I wanted to do, I think it should be taught in every middle school for to go from that to everybody um, needs it. Yep. Everybody, everybody needs, needs those skills. Everyone needs those skills to be successful. Everybody. So and middle school is the perfect age, I think, to teach them because that's when you start to you that's when you start to form maladaptive coping skills. Oh yeah. That's when you so to go from that to EFT was this like huge mind shift, but I think it for me, it was a really fascinating jump and it did help me bring it back down to like attachment theory and even in the anxiety, the depression that to be able to obviously grief is a lot of attachment theory stuff. Right. So but grief was sort of bereavement and grief was sort of this like when I learned EFT for couples, I was like, wow, so many of those skills as a therapist, I use in grief therapy, but I had sort of sectioned that off as like a different kind of like its own section, but pretty much I was very cognitive behavioral. So it was really interesting to kind of bring those into more of my other types of therapy and like attachment really is present for all of us always. Always. And would you say that a lot of Well, how would you describe what emotion-focused therapy is with couples in a nutshell? So in a nutshell, this theory is that couples get caught in a cycle and it's like an infinity loop. And you pretty much can take any fight that a couple has and you can put it in that infinity loop. So usually there's a pursuer and a withdrawer. There's, you know, someone who needs to be heard. They get louder. They pursue the other person. They need to talk it out. And there's somebody who is a withdrawer, right? So like one of, there's a therapist in New York city who writes blogs about a tiger and a turtle, right? There's a tiger. Tigers need to be heard. They get louder and turtles go in and, you know, and it waits for the storm to pass. And that's oftentimes how couples, not all couples, but oftentimes how couples relate to each other. Sometimes those roles can be interspersed. Sometimes it, that's not usually the case, but sometimes. And if you think about it, two tigers, those relationships are really volatile. They usually don't last very long. And two turtles do often meet and get married, but they don't land in your office because they don't talk about anything. <laughs> so yeah. there's no conflict. Yeah. So the couples that usually land in your office are the tiger and the turtle. And the bigger the tiger gets, the more the turtle retreats. The more the turtle retreats, the t- bigger the tiger gets. So that's kind of the dynamic. And it doesn't matter what that like tiger, usually like their biggest fear their, that's matched to their core belief is like this fear of abandonment, right? So obviously the tiger, the turtle retreating is like hits that abandonment schema. And then the turtle's core belief that gets, these are just like examples, obviously, but that gets hit is like, it's now I can never do enough. I can't do it well enough. And that if you can get couples to recognize that they're never going to get their needs met in that infinity loop and that like nonverbal, right. It's couples have it down pat. It's like a look, it starts it right. It's not even like they're never going to get their needs met, but that wife isn't the bad person. The husband isn't the bad person or the, you know, whatever couple that you're working with, like the partners are not the problem. It's this interaction. The system. That's the problem. It's the system. Right. The system is not functioning in a way that's helpful. And once people start to realize that it's like this light bulb, like as long as I keep doing this, this is going to happen. So you start to naturally communicate differently. So, you know, I've taught communication skills till I'm blue in the face with couples. And, but that philosophy was like shocking to me. It almost applies to almost every couple. You can see that. Yep. And yep. And usually, you know, turtles can get really loud too, but that's when they have been 
withdrawn to the point that it's like built up, right? So there's like different, you know, you, but when you can point that out to couples, like this is your pattern, you do this, it, you know, like these are your triggers and they start to communicate different. It's the system that's broken. We just have to fix the system. And when I can show them that, like, it doesn't matter what argument, I don't care about the content of the argument. And people people believe in the content of their arguments. But when you can oh, show yes. them, oh, they want to tell you the whole story. But <laughs> you start to show them, like, so let me get this straight. You know, this is how you told, this is how this came about. This is how you started this conversation. And then you show them, like, and this is how it got this big. And if, and, and it's so powerful. So. Now, is that something that you enjoy as you are, because rebellious, rebellious wellness is now open, open, accepting new clients, or are we still yeah. in the process? No, it's open, accepting new clients. I haven't, yeah, the website is done, so I haven't truly launched everything, um, but I'll be doing that by the end of the month. I'm just waiting on our pictures, actually. <laughs> I had some professional pictures taken. Oh, so nice. pictures. So for, for me to launch it and send every like buddy the email and send out, I'm waiting for like pictures. That's it. So I oh, haven't cool. launched the website yet, but I'm thinking, you know, I think by the end of this month for sure. So, but it's up, it's running, everybody's working. In this new, as you transition from being in private practice, solo, now going into group practice, do you want to work mainly using EFT or are you doing grief or are you trying to do all of it, all of the above? I do all of it because I feel like that's what people say all the time. I'm sure they ask you this too, but people say all the time, like, you know, uh, how do you like see multiple people, like multiple days, like, and I say, because everybody has a different story. So I like to do all of it. Like, that's what I think mixes it up. I don't want to get stuck in one. I, for a lot, for the very beginning of my career, I did a lot of just bereavement, but I don't think that that's really healthy for any therapist to get stuck in. I was just going to ask, yeah, how did you manage? Because it sounds like you clearly have a history with loss and how did you manage doing just bereavement? I mean, bereavement alone is actually one of the more difficult things to specialize in. I remember my, so the first supervisor I ever had at my very first job out of grad school, one of the things he said to me at my orientation was, I can talk to you about X, Y, and Z. We could talk about CBT, DBT, but if there is grief, don't come anywhere near me. Like he made it very, very clear. And I have found that to be true with a lot of therapists that Mm. grief is not something people want to work with. How Mm. did you focus so much on bereavement without losing your mind? I think that it was the internship at Texas Children's Hospital where I think I learned so much about it and it affects everyone. So even sometimes cases that I feel like, and you, I feel like you and I've talked about this, even cases where, you know, I feel like they may have come to me for some other reason. You know, they lost their job, they, their marriage is in trouble, but they didn't come to me for marriage. They were like, it's just like, I feel like some where under that is an unresolved loss. Like when it just doesn't make sense, where you're just like, I'm missing something. Like I'm giving them skills and they're using them, but there's something that doesn't feel like, you know, it's all, it almost always is an unresolved loss. It affects everyone. And sure enough, when you do history on people, and usually there is a loss somewhere that, shape their life in some kind of way. So I think I learned early on how powerful that is. And I think it's fascinating how people grieve. So, you know, it affects everyone and how people grieve 
is based on so many different things, who their their attachments are, who what support they had, like how much they understand about themselves, how old they are, what just so many different things. And unresolved grief is a void that people will stuff and try to pretend like it's not there. And oh, yeah. it comes out people act on it all the time and it's it's so much anxiety too is I think if I didn't have that grief background I don't know that I would understand so much anxiety it's because of an unresolved loss yeah I agree with you and I think that when we say loss and when we talk about grief what I really want everybody out there who's listening to understand is that that doesn't just look like the death of somebody. Certainly the right. death of somebody is very significant. And that is what we're talking about, but that's not all inclusive. Absolutely not. That's the loss of like, uh, that's a divorce and the loss of your parents living together. That's the loss of one of your parents' jobs that led to like a significant loss of your having to move your loss of your home, your loss of your friend group. Like it's all of those that are included in losses that shaped your life that you might not have realized or like grieved those losses. Yep. Yep. It doesn't necessarily have to be death. And I think that so many of us right now in this pandemic are experiencing some sort of grief. Absolutely. Mm Mm-hmm. So some sort of loss. So for me, I was, I was fascinated to learn how different people grieved, how they, and, and to be able to help them, to be able to help people process and move through what they needed to move through to be successful in being able to like, not act out on that unresolved loss, but to process it and understand how it was going to come up in their lives and how to handle it appropriately for them. Or that still is a huge passion of mine. Yeah. And that actually just brings up another question that I think I've always had about grief. And we talk, you've, you've talked a lot about the concept of unresolved grief and unresolved loss And this is something that I, I struggle with. I mean, I know a lot of the listeners on the show do know, you know, where I'm at in terms of my recovery from complex trauma. And I think that's one of the emotions that I struggle with the most is just the magnitude of grief that I feel. And I wonder, and I could just be wondering this because I'm not quite there yet, but what does it mean to have resolved your loss? What does resolved grief look like? I always say that, you know, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who, you know. Right. The five stages of grief. It's like yes, denial, yeah. anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. I mean, she was brilliant. And like, yes. bro- good for you. Wow. I'm so impressed. I'm so glad you said them and you didn't ask me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) um, So a long time ago, I changed acceptance to accommodation. I don't think that, I think acceptance is, I mean, the way that she meant acceptance is accommodating the feelings that come up, accommodating where you're at in this life, like with that loss, right? So, but when people hear acceptance, especially people who have lost a child, because that's one of the hardest griefs to process, or where they've had a tragic loss, acceptance will never make sense to them. So I changed that just from my own practice years ago into accommodation, accommodating those feelings. So resolving grief really is if it's a person that you're grieving, but even if it's a situation that you're grieving, it's honoring that person or honor, understanding how to honor, especially if it's a person, honoring that person. That you have to know that you're, whether it's like, it, that can be, you know, we're very ritual, humans are very ritualistic people. It's 
what a finding something that you do that means something that you like honor that person, right? So resolution really means understanding how that loss plays a role in your life, how it will come up, what it will feel like when it comes up, and being able to accommodate those feelings. That's resolution. Like understanding that you're going to be triggered for the rest of your life when you hear a similar situation, when you see someone grieving, when you, whatever your loss is, when it touches you in your life, you will be triggered. It doesn't go away. Understanding how you'll be triggered and how, and how to accommodate those feelings is resolution. I both love and hate that. And I think that a lot of people will, I think that I'll, I think you'll understand this as I explain more, right? I, I hate it because it's, it's just shitty, right? There's no undoing it. Like grief oh, is grief is grief. A loss is a loss is a loss. And it's just a shitty feeling. With that being said, I love the way you put it because it's not about accepting. It's about, like you said, accommodating, or as I like to call it sometimes, the integration, right? Integrating, yes, this is what happened and this is how it's going to like affect me. How can I move on with my life knowing what I know and feeling the way I feel and still have meaning to my life? So yeah. I love that because I actually think it's very relieving for people to hear that because so many people who go through any kind of grief, whether it's the loss of a child, sexual assault, abuse of a parent, or the traumatic loss of somebody, somebody passed away. So many people are told like, okay, it's been two years. It's time to accept what happened to you. And I think it is so relieving to hear that like, Ah, that's not really what Elizabeth Kubler Ross meant by accept. It's not, it's not, and it never goes away. And I that's one of the first things I say. If I could say one broad statement about bereavement, it takes a lot longer to heal than anybody ever wants to believe it's going to take or wants it to take. And so I, if your friends are saying it's been a year, it's been two years, they have never experienced a loss that you've experienced, even treat trauma. And it is a part of like, if you've had a traumatic childhood, grieving the loss of the parents that you wish you had had, grieving the loss of the childhood that you wish you've had, that's very, very painful. And I think understanding how that's going to come out. So many people are triggered when they have a child. I see it, you know, I see a man now who has children and he was so triggered when he said about his own, own abusive father, when he, he said to me, it's not that hard to be a good father. Like it's not that hard. You, you just are there. You love your kids. You do what's right for them. You do the next thing for them. It's not that hard. And he always felt like it was going to be so hard to be a dad because his dad was abusive and unavailable. And he, he had to grieve. He grieved then like the loss of his father, the loss of the father he wished he had. And that's a really difficult process. I think healing from that means that you understand you will forever be triggered by that as you work through it, you're triggered less and you understand what those triggers are and how to accommodate those feelings when they come up and make better decisions. Yep, but it's still there. Always there. I mean, I think, honestly, I think we could have an entire episode alone on just what can get triggered in terms of grief when you become a parent especially Absolutely. if you have any kind of like childhood abuse or, or anything like that. Um, or even if you've had a miscarriage and I don't think many people understand it's like, but here you have your baby and it's like, it's just, it's so not like that. It's, I, I see a pediatrician um, who had a miscarriage and you would think that she 
And she said, I was so unprepared for what I was going to feel like. And I, I know it's, that yeah. is, um, we could do a whole episode on that alone, but yes, we, we could absolutely, absolutely could. And how un, unrecognized it goes and un, I want to say ungrieved, like, which is not a word, but I'm just making shit up now. It's like, we don't, we don't take the time to even acknowledge that loss. In, in fact, there's so much stigma around it that everybody keeps it to themselves when they suffer a miscarriage. They don't tell anybody. It's so sad. It's yeah, so sad. It's so sad. It is. It is. And not only do you not tell people, but the hormonal impact, uh, there's so much that goes into that loss. It is very un acknowledged. And interestingly enough, I think one of the other un- most unacknowledged griefs is um, the loss of a friend. There's an author who um, wrote a book. His name's Harold Ivan Smith. He's a phenomenal author on grief. And I saw him speak after he wrote that book. I lost a friend 10 years ago. And I saw him speak on that about three years before I, before she got sick. And he's right. He says, our friends are like the people we choose to be closest in our lives. And yet he, he made people raise their hand in the audience. How many, how many days do you get off? Like, you know, show, show numbers on your finger. How many days do you get off if your friend passes away? Zero. Most people. But if your cousin's wife passes away, you probably get two days and you've met her twice. So like it's an unacknowledged grief. And I, yeah. I really, that's the um, word. Yep. Unacknowledged. Acknowledged. And so, and so is it, there are several unacknowledged groups. That's one of them. A miscarriage is certainly right in there. It's really there. Are, and they're such personal losses too. So, mm-hmm. so in a way it's almost like, as you as you continue this next stage of your life and your professional development with rebellious wellness counseling, you really will continue to encounter grief because grief is really there for us in a thousand different ways and shapes and forms. Mm-hmm. So it's something that you'll always be working with. Absolutely. I absolutely think that it is there for everyone. And, and the difference in, like I said, healing, where you learn to accommodate those feelings and understand that you will always be triggered and learn to do self-care like things when you get triggered and learn to accommodate those feelings and not, not act out on those feelings, react to them the way that you need to react, you know, to them, like react, react appropriately to those triggers and accommodate those feelings that come up when you don't, when you have unresolved grief that can turn into like many different problems. So you act out on that grief. So you become anxious because you try to control things that you can't control because you're trying to prevent something bad from happening because there's like unresolved, an unresolved issue and unresolved grief, right? That's definitely one way that I've seen anxiety begin to spiral out of control. OCD disorders sometimes are grief related. It's very, people don't ever think that, but when you pair, start to pare down or pare away the layers, it's, you know, oftentimes it comes down to unresolved grief. Yeah, Absolutely. I, I agree a thousand percent. Now, with your new practice, how many people are there on your team? So you're the founder. Mm-hmm. And yes. how many people are there? There's four people all together. So me and three other pe- therapists. And does everybody specialize in something different or is it? So I supervised all, all of them. <laughs> Um, so oh, Stacy, um, Stacy Tarzi is one of the therapists. I supervised her in 1998. So she got her license in 2000. And then Annette Clark is, she just recently graduated with her master's degree and she specializes in children and adolescents. So that's not a specialty that I have. I usually see adolescents and adults. So she's, she has a little bit of a different 
specialty. And Deanne Mishler, who's also part of our team, does the DBT groups. So she has that specialty. She's also a certified yoga therapist. So she does therapeutic yoga. Oh, so you've got people with all different backgrounds. I do. Yes. I love I know. it. I'm very lucky. Well, and, and I love it because I also think it goes with just to circle back with kind of the theme of what rebellious wellness counseling is. So I'm I'm actually on the website right now. And for those of you who are listening, it's rebelliouswellnesscounseling.com. I will link it in the show notes and it will be in the newsletter and on the Facebook page. So no worries about that. If you miss the spelling or anything, just check online. But the quote right when you go on the website is the quote that really inspired this group practice, which is, in a world that profits from escapism and self-doubt, personal development is an act of rebellion. So I love that you have all different people in your practice who have these different kinds of specialties and different areas of expertise that they bring to the table. Mm -hmm. I just think it's, I just think it's awesome. It's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I do some of my, my roommate from college is a crisis counselor in DC. She was like, not a fan of the name. A couple of other people in my friend group were like, "Mm, I'm not sure about it. And I was passionate about the name because it is how I practice. I feel like I am not a, you know, I, I do feel like I'm a warm and like welcoming therapist, but I also think people have to work if they want to get better. So. Oh yeah. You are both a cup of tea and a strong shot of whiskey, <laughs> me- metaphorically <laughs> speaking. Like Rebecca will make you feel so supported and so cared about, but she'll also kick you in the ass metaphorically if you need to be kicked in the ass. And listen, we all need that in therapy. Like, you know, for the most part, I don't think most people go to therapy just to kind of, you know, have tea and crimpets. I think it's people, well, I shouldn't say some people do want to go to therapy just to talk and not hear that there's anything wrong or that there are any issues that they have to work on. But that's not how you practice. And right. that's just exactly what the name conveys, which is like, you are incredible at what you do and you don't pull any punches, but you say, the way your delivery, the way you say things makes, it makes everything easier to hear. Thank you very much for saying that. <laughs> that's so funny. Um, I love that. I, I can't wait to tell um, my family that you said I was like a cup of tea and a shot of whiskey. That'll be that'll go over huge. Um, <laughs> but um, and, and I, I mean that in the best way possible. I know. Like, I love that. I love that. I do. I try to live my life that way. Like I also think it's like I do believe in authenticity, and I I'm not. I don't just practice that way. I feel like I live my life that way, and. And, you know, I, I also think, as you said, like you're a lot of your listeners know your journey and I also am pretty open and, you know, have had, I mean, one of the reasons I'm really passionate about grief, I've had a lot of losses in my life. And I think every one of them, like I had to, I had to understand and grieve and, you know, go through therapy and understand how that was going to continue to come up. We had I had a house fire. I think you knew that I had a house fire six years ago and our yeah. house went down in the middle of the night. And I just was watching a show not too long ago. And um, my sister was visiting and she said, is, is it okay to watch this because the house burnt down? And I was like, yeah, I can watch this. But, you know, it's just interesting how that like comes yeah. up just, and that's such a huge loss. So it, you're right. It doesn't always have to be people. It can be, definitely can traumatic events happen all the time. And it's just understanding and being able to like work through them. And so, and as a therapist to like be able to seek help, you know, we all went to therapy like immediately and have the courage to work through them yourself. So, you know, have the courage to like walk in that path. Like, 
and let people know that they're not alone. You're all, you've also had to walk in that path sometimes. I feel like that's what I love about you is that you're so honest and open. And I feel like that that's authenticity. So. Yep. Showing up as yourself. I think it makes you, it requires you to be vulnerable, but it also brings the most benefit in terms of making great connections. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I believe that. Mm-hmm. Well, I thank you so much for coming on the show today. Rebelliouswellnesscounseling.com. I will again link the website. They are open for business. Yep. Taking new clients, doing telehealth. Reach yep. out. Rebecca is amazing and her team is no doubt amazing as well. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. I was so excited that you asked me. So thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information about today's episode and to sign up for the Light After Trauma newsletter, head over to my website at alyssascolari.com. I'm also on Twitter and I'd love to chat with you guys. Be sure to follow me. My Twitter handle is Alyssa Scolari. Thanks again for listening and take good care.